Okay, here's the story. Back in August, my Twitter friend Bullport, who makes these artistic circuit boards and the software for creating them, was looking for ways to increase business. So I said, semi-seriously, make a cat board because, as we know, the internet loves cats. Wisely, he decided not to go down that path, but that didn't stop my little pea brain, so I thought, well, why don't I build a cat board? Because, as we know, the internet loves cats. I wasn't actually going to make a cat-shaped board. I was just going to use the name, but I still had to figure out what it would do. Meanwhile, I had another friend, Ed Vidal, who was working with my stick it motherboard that attaches a Zula 2 FPGA board to a Raspberry Pi. Ed was porting the excess tools to the Pi so it could load the FPGA with a bitstream. But bitstreams had to be compiled somewhere else because the Xilinx design tools were too big and used too much memory on the Pi and because they were hard to install with the licenses and all. So my little pea brain got back into the act again and asked, what if I could build a board with an FPGA where all the tools ran right on the Pi? Then you could have a complete FPGA development board that fit right in the palm of your hand. It so happened that earlier in the year, Clifford Wolf had reverse engineered the bitstream format for some of the lattice ICE40 FPGAs to create the ice storm tools. By combining those with the Yosis synthesizer and the Arachne PNR place and route tools, both open source, that allowed him to build a complete end-to-end -end set of open source FPGA design tools. So Ed ported Yosis, Arachne PNR, and iStorm and integrated them into a Raspberry Pi image that fits in a 4GB SD card. Now all I had to do was build a Raspberry Pi hat board with a lattice FPGA on it, and there's your handheld FPGA kit right there. But that's easy, right? The hard part was coming up with a grand concept. I ever tell you about my Star Trek script? Star Trek script? Yeah, I gotta write it down is all. So what to put on the board? Well, start with the Raspberry Pi it connects to. Then there's the Lattice ICE 40 FPGA naturally. Then add an SPI flash for standalone operation when this thing isn't connected to the Pi. Add some SPI connections from the GPIO so the Pi can program the FPGA or the SPI flash. Connect the remaining GPIO from the Raspberry Pi to the FPGA so they can talk to one another. Break out the GP clock zero line and use it as an adjustable frequency FPGA clock signal from the Pi. Tack on some SD RAM the FPGA can use for local storage. Add ports to the outside world. PMOD connectors for PMOD boards, Grove connectors for Grove boards, a generic pin header for God knows what kind of boards, and a SATA connector for boards that use differential I.O. Attach some user I.O. like buttons, switches, LED blinkies. Supply an additional 100 MHz clock oscillator for standalone operation and so people don't freak out because it's not a high speed clock. And let's not forget the support circuitry. A 3.3 volt regulator that steps down the 5 volt from the Pi for the FPJ and the SD RAM. Another 1.2 volt regulator for the FPJ core. And might as well throw in an adjustable regulator for one of the FPGA's I.O. banks. Finally, add a jack for an external power supply when the Pi isn't attached. That's a lot of stuff for a board that's smaller than a credit card, but it's just a matter of placement and routing, so it can't be that hard. I gotta write it down is all! Start off by creating some schematics, then do an initial parts placement, then try routing a high density section to make sure there's no problems, then do some more placement, then add a liberal sprinkling of bypass capacitors and finish the routing, then generate the Gerber files, then send them to PCBWay for fabrication, and one week and 150 bucks later you'll receive the boards. They look pretty good, but let's put them under a microscope and see if anything nasty shows up. This is a shot of the FPGA's BGA footprint. You can see the solder mask is misaligned with the pads by about 3 mils. That's 0.075 millimeters for you metric nerds. Luckily, the nearby traces and vias haven't been exposed, which might have led to shorts to the BGA pins. Here's a shot of the SD RAM pads, and you can once again see the same 3 mil misalignment of the solder mask. But, once again, no adjacent traces have been exposed. Here's another shot of the BGA, this time showing some drill misalignment on one of the small 20 mil vias. The drill hasn't broken completely out of the pads, so there's still a good connection there. This is about the worst V I could find on the board. The rest look pretty good. 
Finally, let's look at the silk screen. This shows the opposite corners of the BGA. You can see the silk screen has been pushed up just a little bit, about 10 mils with respect to the BGA pads. Normally this isn't a problem, but since I'll be using the BGA silk screen outline to align the FBGA to the pads during assembly, I'll have to take this into account. So overall, the PCB should probably work. The punch bowl may have been pissed in a bit, but there's not a big turd in there. So now it's just a matter of soldering the parts onto the board. I gotta write it down is all! Oh, one final test before I go. The board does fit onto the Raspberry Pi. Yay.